And so I just want you to know that we take it extremely seriously and very thankful that you're here with us. And we pray uh, truly by God's grace that we have treated you guys well. And we just want you to know that we really care. So if you please don't mind whether you're new or it's your first time, fill out that connection card. It is our heart to connect. Okay? So many times you go to a church, they don't even acknowledge you. We want to let you know that they acknowledge you. And so please, if you would, please, please, please do us the great uh, favor of filling that out, dropping it in the basket or the boxes as you leave. Uh, a couple things I just want to talk about real quick, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get to the message. Number one is in two weeks. Everybody say two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks, we have this thing called One Big Day. Say One Big Day. One Big Day. Okay, let's try that again. Like everybody say all one time. One Big Day. One Big Day. And one big day is where we want to see all the people who call Sojo come for one big day. Because here's the here's the, the fact of the reality. Uh, the average church attender comes 1.7 times every single month, which equals 17 times a year. Which means that the church, if we're honest with ourselves, Sojo is probably about three times as big as what we see. And so what it would be if everybody would join together one day and ask God, what's my next year? That's the heart. Everybody from Sojo joined one day together and say, hey God, what's my next step? Because Christianity is a journey. It's not one-time salvation. Salvation is a process. And every single one of us, no, no, no matter if we've been following Jesus forever or if we've been following Jesus one minute, everybody's got a next step. And so with that heart, I want to pray for us and then we'll get into Exodus chapter one. Father, hide me behind your cross. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift that you've given to each and every one of your children. And I pray, Father, by your grace and by your mercy, that for the skeptic that's in the room today, you speak to him or her. For the one who feels oppressed and burdened, that you will speak to him and her. For the one who is apathetic at best, that you will speak to him and or her. For those who are seeking and hungering after your righteousness, that you would speak to him or her. God, I believe that you have brought us to this place. You have a message for every single one of us in our own unique spaces and or places. And so today, God, we believe that a different place with a different pace will bring a new perspective. So I pray that that perspective is your glorious gospel through the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with me, would you simply say, I agree by saying, amen. Well, this sermon is called A Righteous Rebellion. A Righteous Rebellion. So righteous means holy. Rebellion means resistance. So a holy resistance. When we look at the book of Exodus, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a righteous or a holy resistance. So what I want us to really understand is that God has called us to be just like these Egyptians. Not Egyptians, but the Hebrews that lived in an Egyptian world. And that name for those people would be called sojourners. So they were sojourning in Egypt awaiting a promised land. For those of you guys who don't know, so many, so many people like, I was gone this week, they'd ask me what the name of the church is, and I'd say sojo, and they'd look at me like I had 12 eyes, and I get it. I get it. Like, who names their church after a restaurant up the road? Like, I get it. I don't know. <laughs> so goes, sojo. You'll get it eventually, and then you'll go home and you'll laugh, and you'll go eat sojos later. But who names their church? And so the, the church's name was originally called Sojourner, because the idea of a sojourner is a person who is awaiting their heavenly home. The problem is we live in a biblically illiterate society, and so the word sojourner is not on anybody's uh, mind. They haven't heard it before, and so uh, with that, people would say, like what you say when you go to Walmart. By the way, if you go to Walmart, it's not called the Walmarts. It's simply just Walmarts. When you watch YouTube, it's not the YouTubes. Like, it's simply just YouTube. Come on, raise your hand if you're in the South. You hear that aggravates you or you laugh inwardly. I'm sorry. Like, when I hear you say, I was watching the YouTube, I'm like, yep, you're right there. I got you. We're good. We're good. Place you right there. And I say it all the time, so here. Redneck number one right here, okay? Amen, hallelujah, right? But but when we look at this, this, this story, the story may have taken place 4,000 years ago, but still incredibly accurate today in 2021. And, and if you don't catch anything through this series, is that the Word of God is about people. And I don't know, man, when I look at plagues and I look at COVID-19, I'm thinking, man, ain't much changed. When I look at a government that tries to oppress its people, I think, you know what? 
No one's changed. So at the end of the day, when we look at this, we sometimes we look at these as ancient people and we think, you know, it doesn't apply to me. And I think it's about people and people have not changed. People are continuously trying to control and manipulate. That's for the world that we live in. And so when we look at the Exodus, that's what we're looking at. Is this idea of this God who loves his people and wants his people to be set free. And if you don't think that he wants that for you today, then you are lying to yourself. And I pray that God speaks to you incredibly. Because the God of the universe knows every single person's name in this room this morning. The God of the universe wants everybody in this room to experience freedom in the name of Jesus. Can you guys clap for that and say amen? And God said, I welcome your golf clap. Let's dig into Exodus chapter 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few verses, explain a little bit, read a few verses, explain a little bit, and then we'll close. I've got 28 minutes, so that's your timer. So if you want to set your timer, you can. It's actually 28 minutes and 33 seconds, so just so you guys don't hammer me after that. Uh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1 says this. These are the names of the son of Israel, sons of Israel, who came to Egypt with Jacob. So before you see that, you have to understand that there was this guy named Adam. And God gave a promise to Adam. Then later on, there's this God named Noah. And God gave a promise to Noah. That promise was be fruitful and multiply, fill and subdue the earth. Same promise that he gave to Adam. And then we see this guy named Abraham. And Abraham's given this promise about this idea that he's going to start a new nation. And he hasn't even had a son. He's nine years old. And God fulfills that promise about 11 years after that promise. And these sons are the fulfillment of this promise. And so that's why I continually say this idea that God, what? I'm glad you guys are confident in that statement. That's when we feel good. So God keeps his promises. So when we see this line, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each of his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Don't forgive me. Gad and Asher, what we're really reading is not the names of people, but we're reading the fulfillment of a promise. And that's what the author is trying to get at, that God keeps his promises. And if you see me do this a lot, I really don't understand why I do it, but I do it. And so just chill with me. And those of you guys who are like, I'm, I'm going to watch that the whole Turkish Tower sermon. So I'm okay with that. What did you hear today? I heard this guy do these waves all day long. The total number of Jacob's descendants was 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation eventually died, but the Israelites fulfilled the mission of God. The Israelites were fruitful, increased rapidly, and multiplied because that's the mission of God for his people to be fruitful, to bear fruit. If you don't take anything away from it today, the mission of God's people is to be fruitful, to multiply, to make disciples. Sometimes making disciples get with your wife and making disciples, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Again, you might get that later while you're in Sogos. I'm okay with that. But the Israelites were fruitful, increased rapidly, and multiplied. And they became extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. A new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. And so that's what I want to dwell with that one line right there. A new king came and he did not know about Joseph. He came to power in Egypt. And so the question that I want to ask with that one statement is, would you agree and or say amen if you feel like in 2021 in North Carolina or in America, any place that we're living in a rapidly growing godless culture? Amen. So raise your hand if you would agree that in 2021, we are living in an increasingly more rapid godless culture. Would you, would you raise your hand by that? And so as you raise your hand, I want you to point at me. Point at me. And this is going to sting a little bit. Because we can point to our government and say the government's fault. But what we do when we point to somebody else, guess what we do? And Mike Davis is a point man because he already knows. We point three fingers back at ourselves. The reason why we are living in an ever- more rapidly, increasingly godless culture is because the culture looks at us and they don't see what we say. Amen. Let me say that again. The culture looks at us and they don't see with their eyes a people who say that they have given it all for a king who hung on the cross 
and gave everything for them. What they see is a cultural Christianity that goes to church on Sunday and lives like hell Monday through Saturday. And I know that stings a little bit, but it's true. We live in the most biblically illiterate society on the most advanced planet and continent on the earth. We have more resources, more churches, more money than any other church in the world. And yet, we love God the least. Tell me why in places like China, the church is exploding. South America, the church is exploding. In Afghanistan, while the Taliban is taking over, the church is exploding. But in America, we sit in our comfy chairs, in our air-conditioned room, and we give God $10, and we think that we're doing him a favor. We're living in an ever more growing godless culture here in America. And we can point our finger at somebody else. But when we point our finger at somebody else, what we're really doing is pointing our fingers at ourselves. And here's what I want to, if I don't hit you here, come here, come here. Come here. This is my child. Raise your hand if you have one. I love this child. I would do anything for her. I would literally lay my life down as you would. Amen? Amen? You would lay your life down for your child. You would give him anything that you could or can and you would work your body to the bone to give it to them because you believe in their future. You believe in what they want. You want, to have, you want them to have a better life than you had before. What greater gift can you give them than Jesus and falling madly in love with him. Amen. There is no greater gift and there's no greater thing that will change our culture than to teach our children to fall madly in love with Jesus. And the only way that I can teach my child to be madly in love with Jesus is if I am in love with Jesus. Vision is not taught, it is caught. When my child sees me on the floor on my knees with my Bible open, she's seeing that. She's seeing that her daddy loves Jesus. And I pray, I screw up all the time, don't I? Mommy and I fight all the time, don't I? I yell at you all the time, don't I? There's all these bad things, but I pray to God that she sees me even in my flaws. Go back to God. Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. You can tell all my secrets on social media later. <laughs> if we want to change the culture, we have to make sure. This line says, a new king rose up and he did not know Joseph. And the thing that I thought about is, who are the people in my life that I've lost contact with? And how do I reconnect myself to these people that I want them to know? And then I thought about our church and our kids. And I thought about, man, how many of us want so much better for our children? All of us. Not, not one doesn't want more for our children. And there is no greater gift than to give our children a true relationship and not a religion. There is no greater gift that we can give our children is a true relationship. Relationship is teaching them to connect with God. Religion is teaching them to be afraid of God. And guys, I'm afraid or I'm concerned that we are teaching our children all together to be morally upright, which is not a bad thing. But sometimes the good is the enemy of the great. We're not teaching them to have a relationship because we don't have a relationship. Verse number nine says this. So this king comes to power and he says to his people, look at these Israelites. The people are more numerous than we are. Come us, let us deal shrewdly, which I think is a very interesting word because it's the same Hebrew word that we see in Genesis chapter 3. When the serpent comes on the scene 
seen and it says, and the serpent was more shrewd than any of the other animals. It means that it had a worldly wisdom about himself. And so this king comes to power and says, let us deal with these people with a worldly wisdom. He says, otherwise they will multiply further. And when war breaks out, they will join our enemies. What the word actually means is they will rise up against us and they will take power. Fight against us and then leave the country, which is ironic because that's what they end up doing anyway. In verse 11, so the Egyptians attack, assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. They built these cities called Pitom and Ramses to supply cities for Pharaoh. Now listen to this verse. But the more that they oppressed them, the more that they multiplied and spread. So that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, they worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with difficult labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly opposed all of this work on them. So here are these migrant people, a minority people group living in a nation state. And the dominant culture looks at them and tries to oppress them. Man, it can sound like a lot like 2021 to me. But these were not ordinary people. These were God's people. And God does what? He keeps what? And God is making a nation. He's building a nation. And so why in the oppression do God's people flourish? What is it about God that he shows his people such favor in the midst of oppression? I believe that God is revealing himself to these people, but revealing a characteristic about himself. And the characteristic of God that he's trying to impress on his people is that as a people, you will be blessed. Can somebody say that word with me? Blessed. blessed. Blessed is not a material. Blessed is a perspective. Yes. Blessed is not a material possession. Blessed is a perspective. God is revealing himself to his people. And what he's trying to reveal to his people is that as a people, because you have my promise, you are blessed. Now, you may not always see the evidence of that promise, but... I promise you, I will keep my promise. And so God is revealing himself that you are blessed. And by your blessing, this is you. We're not talking about Egypt and the Israelites right now. We are called to be a blessing. We live in the richest country in the world. Do you know that there are people who live on less than a dollar a day? And we have people who are refusing to go to work right now for anything less than $1,500, $15 an hour, and a $1,000 sign-on bonus. We live in the most blessed country in the world. And we are God's people. And as God's people, we are called to be a blessing with that which we have been blessed with. And so as these people, I want us to realize, like, God is blessing his people. I know you're struggling. I know you have problems. You know why I know you have problems? Because I got problems too. But even in the midst of my worst problem, I promise you that I have it a whole lot better than the church in Afghanistan right now. Did you guys know? that the government pulled out of Afghanistan and the Taliban is going back into each one of those cities and they are literally chopping heads off of Christians today, right now. You got a problem, but it ain't nearly as bad as theirs. And so because of that, God is revealing to us as his people that we have been blessed and we are blessed to be a blessing now, blessing does not equal easy and comfortable. It ain't easy preaching to you like this today. Do you think I'm having fun right now? Because I know I'm going to get an email this week. 
So I'm married. Is it one? Is it two? Is it five? Some of y'all might choose to leave. I pray you don't. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. But it is life. And sometimes life is hard. And we need to know. Listen to this. We need to know that we are called to show our faith, not just say it. We need to know that we are called to show who we believe in by the way that we live, not just say it on Facebook one time a week with my sojo selfie, which are all dope. Please keep doing it. But don't show your sojo selfie and then the rest of the week, it's kind of like having the sojo bumper sticker and then you cut somebody off and give them a finger. Like, that's not good. Can we all agree? Not good. I've been tempted. I ain't going to lie. But that sticker at least holds me back. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for that sticker. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that sticker. That he said, no temptation has overcome me. And that sticker's helpful. Now, I got one question. Has anybody got any weeds at their house? I hate weeds. Now, you should say I love weed, but I hate weeds. I hate them. I hate weeds. Like, I have to take care of the grass at home. I, I'm cutting the grass. I'm mowing the grass. I'm weeding the grass. I'm all that. I've got to cut all the bushes back. I've been the weed. It's raining 18,000 inches this week. My grass is up to here. But in my driveway, I've got all these weeds. And I can't tell you how many times I've sprayed ortho roundup on those weeds. And you know what they keep doing? They keep growing. And here's what I see when I think about these weeds. I'm like, I can't keep them from growing. Can, you, can anybody agree? Can anybody say amen? Like, I hate weeds. But when I think about those weeds, what I think about is God's people. You can try to stop us out. You can try to control us. You can try to oppress us, but we ain't going away. We are God's people. We are called to be His people. We are called to grow. Listen here. 4,500 churches closed in 2020. Wow. In America. 4,500 churches closed. And that could be looking like, you know what? Well, how can the church continue to grow if all these churches are closed? Here's why. Well, they stopped being a church. That's right. They became a country club. It's too easy. It's too easy to turn inward and say, these are my friends. These are people I, I do life with and my family. And that's a good thing. We should be a community with a cause that loves each other. But if we forget about the people who are stuck in Egypt, who are oppressed, who have a yoke of bondage around their neck for our own sake of our own comfort, we cease to be God's church. And I talked to pastors this week, and I heard at least three of them talk about how their church shrank and how many other churches have shrank in COVID. And I think about how our church has doubled in COVID. And the only thing that I can think of is God's favor and God's grace because we learned two important lessons. Lesson number one, love the people that you have and go serve the ones that you don't. And I don't ever want to lose that. And here's what I know. 4,500 churches closed in 2020 and 6,000 will close in 2021. While we're only planting 3,000 churches every single year, which means that there is a shortfall. And yes, we're calling to plant more churches. That's not what I'm getting to. What I'm getting to is, man, if we want to change culture, we've got to teach our kids to love Jesus, fall madly in love with Jesus. But if our kids don't see us falling in love with Jesus, then we look at them and say, you're a poser. Listen, I used to be a poser, and I'm kind of like this. Uh, 12 through 22, okay, 10 years, a decade of my life. I tried to pretend to be somebody I was not. Anybody else? Anybody? Got one in the back. Anybody receiving Jesus today? I tried to be something that I was not because I was looking for someone to accept me and I was willing to betray who I was to be somebody else for the sake of somebody else's approval. And I want us to hear in this place, God is calling us to be his people. And so many of us have traded his people for other people to prove. And you know who you are in here today. You go to work and you're somebody different. 
You go out to the golf course and you're somebody different. You go out to hot yoga or burn boot camp. Whatever it is you ladies do. Now, I ain't gonna lie. I, I would like to try hot yoga. That sounds kind of cool. I mean, not metaphor, not literally cool, but metaphorically cool. I don't think I can. Come on, y'all. And I'm trying to lighten the mood up a little bit. I know it's been so heavy. Anyway, so many of us are posing. And here's the thing I want you to hear. God has called his church to be essential. We were all the essential workers in the beginning of the pandemic. God has called his church to be essential. The problem is that the world sees us as titled. Oh, I didn't hear no, oh, like, oh, or something good. No, that's the truth. The church has been called to be essential. But so many of us have turned and we become entitled. We have become more concerned about our national freedoms than the souls of our neighbors. We become so concerned more about masks and vaccines than the salvation of the person who lives, lives beside. And when we trade our national freedoms, which I'm not saying that we should not be concerned with those, what I'm saying is we become more concerned, more concerned with our national freedoms than our neighbor, than what we have is idolatry. We have traded God for a flag, and it's not the Christian one. And we have elevated those 13 stripes and those 50 stars and what they symbolize, which is great. I'm not saying that it's not great. I love America. I am blessed to live in America. But when I trade that flag above that cross, what I'm saying is I serve a different God, and that God is the red, white, blue. And there are many of us who have done that. And today, we need to repent and ask God to forgive us for posing for somebody that we're not. And begin to love our neighbor. Verse 15 says this. So this king of Egypt said to these Hebrew midwives, a midwife is somebody who helps a person or a family to give birth. The first whose name was Shipra, and the second whose name was Pua. Now, this is a big deal to put two midwives who are servant people and also ladies names in the text. There's not many names of women lifted up in the text of Old Testament scripture. There are some, but not a whole lot. So these are incredibly heroic women. You'll find out why. It says in verse 16, when you help these Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver, and if the child is a son, kill them. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them, and they let the boys live. You know what? It sounds a lot like 2021. 30 miles down the road, we've got the largest abortion center in all of North Carolina. Angel, how many babies get aborted every single week there? Four to three, four hundred people, three to four hundred lives are taken without ever having the chance of giving life. And here's these women standing up and having a righteous rebellion, standing up for life. In October, we have an opportunity to stand up for life too. At this largest abortion center in all of North Carolina, partner with one of the most amazing ministries around. When you think of abortion ministry, you think of people holding signs and calling people and saying, I hate them. When you think of love life, what you think of is an organization who sits there and sings worship music and prays around a circle for the lives of the ladies who are walking to that abortion center that they would be convicted to raise that child, not take the life of that child. A righteous rebellion. In verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. In verse 18, it says, So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, What's going on? Why aren't they? Why are they still living? The midwives said to Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're vigorous. Can you imagine saying that to the king? These girls are strong. <laughs> and they give birth before the midwife can even get to them. So God was good in the midst of a righteous rebellion to the midwives. 
and the people of God multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Pharaoh then commanded all his people, forget the midwives, throw all the men in the water. Just kill them all. I don't care how old they are. Throw them in the Nile. That's some dark stuff. Can you imagine something like that happening? Oh, wait, it does. I'm sorry. It's literally happening right now. Just throw them away. Sell them for parts. Make them into medicine. Is that uncomfortable for you guys today? Is that hard? It is hard. It's dark. But it's true. And ignorance is not always bliss. So what are we as the people of God to do in the midst of dark times? Where is God in the midst of COVID-19 as Delta variant cases are literally skyrocketing through the roof? We have more cases now than we had in January. Where is God in the midst of an Afghani world where the Taliban has taken over and literally killing Christians by the hundreds as we literally speak? Where is God in the midst of just 30 miles down the road, ladies are allowing their babies to be traded for parts? Where is God? How many of us more honest have asked God in the last 18 months, where are you? Whether it's about COVID-19 or your marriage, COVID-19 or your job, COVID-19 or anything else that's happened, you've looked at your life and you're thinking to yourself, where is God in the midst of all of this darkness and all of this oppression and all of this slavery that seems to be going on in our world? Why doesn't he intervene? What if God is teaching us a lesson through these midwives? To stop asking God, where are you? And start asking God, what am I to do? Is there darkness in the world? Raise your hand if you agree. Is there darkness in this world? Raise your hand if you agree. You know the awesome and the also terrible thing about all this darkness? All of us see a different form of darkness. Some of you guys, when I talk about love life, your gut shrivels up and you don't want to talk about it. I get it. I get it. I understand. When I talk about the Taliban and all that, your gut shrivels up, you want to talk about it. I get it. I get it. When you talk about COVID-19, I get it. I've been tired of it. I get it. But here's what I know about every single one of us. Every single one of us has a different misery and darkness that we see in this life. It might be your marriage, it might be your child, it might be something altogether. I don't know what it is, but all I know is that every single person in this room has a different darkness that they see and they're asking God, where are you? And this is what T.D. Jakes calls ministry. Because where your misery is, is where your ministry is. Where you see darkness and where you see oppression, that's where your ministry is. That's where we're called to make an impact. Because we are the blessed people of God, and they can try to stomp us out all they want. But if we're the church, then we will be the church, and we will grow, and we will go. Amen. But the question that you have to ask is, what is God calling me to do? We need a righteous rebellion. We need a holy resistance. But what does that look like? When I think about a holy resistance, I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul says, therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. That means we wear the Carolina Panthers shirt. Stand up for me, Dave, real quick. I love you, and I love CMC. Can you keep, can you keep standing? Listen, he's wearing the jersey. He's an ambassador for the Panthers. And the name that he's on the back is not his name. It's Christian McCaffrey, which I love, I love. Keep standing, keep standing for me. We're called to wear the jersey of Christ and him crucified. And it's not our name on the back, it's his name on the back. That is what we're called to do. You didn't know that you were for our day to wear that jersey today, but you were. You sit down. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ to wear his jersey because God is making his appeal to people who are broken and lost through us. 
You are the missionaries of God. When you go to work, whether it's behind the screen or in person, you are the ambassadors for our king. When people look at you, do they want to say, I want to be like you or not? All of us are preaching a sermon. The, the question is, is how good is it? It's not whether you're preaching a sermon. It's whether you're living up to the sermon that you're preaching. This is what the scriptures preach. God is making his appeal through me. He's making his appeal through you. He's making his appeal through us. And we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Leave your Egypt behind. Your slavery, your oppression. Look at me, I'm free. I was a dope dealer. Nothing. Absolutely no drive, no nothing. And in an instant, God changed me. And over time, he's allowed me to become the person I am. Barely graduated high school. Now I have a master's. Never thought I'd work a better job than working at a gas station. Now I'll make more money than I ever have in my life. Through God's grace and his mercy. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for every single one of us. So I plead to you, not on my behalf, on Christ's behalf, leave each of the people. Leave it. Leave the yoke of slavery behind. That's what Egypt represents to the New Testament person, a place of oppression and a place of slavery. And so many of us in here today, if we're honest, we're wearing not the jersey of Christ, but the yoke of oppression and sin. Idolatry. Worshiping something other than the cross. Pornography for men and women here today who would rather sit behind a screen and to love your wife. Or love your husband. Gambling. Addiction to work. Drugs. Alcohol. So many different things. Oppression. Worshiping a flag. So many different things. Oppression. And the king says, be reconciled to me. Hear what the king has done in verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Jesus was perfect, and he has imputed. You know what imputed? It means to give away. He has taken his righteousness, and he's given his righteousness to us, and therefore we impute our sinfulness onto him. It's called the great exchange. Martin Luther talked about, imagine you're at a wedding, and as you walk down, the groom is standing there waiting for his bride in all of her splendor and all of her glory and that beautiful white dress and that white dress with that train that goes on for three miles. And as all the people stand, the music starts to play, the bride opens up the doors and she starts walking in and the dress is tattered and dirty. It smells like bone and mildew. And as she comes down, the groom is looking at her with tears in his eyes, glory in his face. Because he knows that when she says yes, she'll be made perfect. And that's what happens to us when we give our lives to Jesus. We are the cat of God. Smell for smell all of that word. Smelling, moldy, and all that stuff. And all he's saying is, will you say yes? Leave Egypt behind. Exodus is all about escaping Egypt. It's a biblical metaphor for sin and oppression. And the cross is our escape from slavery of sin and oppression. Let me ask you four questions this morning to make it very close. Are you posing today? Are you posing as a Christian? You live one way on Sunday and live some other different Monday through Saturday. And if you know that you're posing, what do you need to do about it? You need to repent. You need to come up to the altar, sit in your seat, and thank God for his mercy in your life. And ask him to give you a desire to change. Number two, how does my life reflect one that is helping lead people out of Egypt? How does my life reflect somebody who's begging people, pleading on Christ's behalf, 
Leave your slavery. Leave your oppression for the life God living is better. Number three, and in what ways do I carry the role of God's ambassador into my life, my job, my family, my friendships? In what ways can I leave this place today and begin to carry the role of God's ambassador, wearing the jersey of Jesus into my job, my family, and my friends. What one thing that you can work on this week to begin to be God's ambassador? What's one thing that you can do? Maybe that's to pray, God, change my heart. Maybe that is to serve this one person. Maybe it's to go tell this one person. But what's one thing that you can accomplish this week to be Christ's ambassador in your job, in your family? And your friendships. And the last question I have is who in here wants and or needs to be saved from the oppression in your life, from the yoke of slavery in your life, whether that is anything from drugs and alcohol to sinful relationship or simply apathy and everything in between who in here today needs to trade that yoke of slavery for the cross that gives you freedom and the ability to cross through that sea on dry land. Are you posing today? Does your life reflect one who's helping lead people out of Egypt? In what way, what's one thing you can do to be God's ambassador in your family, your relationships, and your jobs? And lastly, who in here needs to be saved, rescued, from slavery and oppression? Remember, we recognize, all of us recognize here that we're living in a godless society, an ever-growing godless society. And we point to that other person as their fault. We're pointing three fingers back at ourselves. And if we want to change culture, we've got to teach our children to fall madly in love with Jesus. But we cannot teach our children to fall madly in love with Jesus if we are not madly in love with Jesus. If you agree with that, would you say amen? I want to pray for us this morning. And if you're posing and you want to come forward today to pray, pray. If you need, if you want to know more about that being rescued, I'm up here. Please come say something to me. I want to pray with you. I want to help lead you to that one next step that you're taking. And everything in between there. Father, as we sing this last song, I pray that I have been biblically accurate. I believe, pray God that I've spoken, not in my own soapbox, God, but by your spirit. And I pray God that every single person here knows that I preach not from hatred from my heart, but love from my bones and a desire to see a church authentically worship King Jesus and King Jesus alone. I pray God that more than anything that this church realizes I want us to be a church that when people walk in here, they feel something different. It's like walking into a whole different atmosphere from the world. And when they come here, they feel safe. They come here, they feel loved. When they come here, they, they sense the presence of your spirit and your son. And the only way for us to get there is to look at ourselves and look at the garbage that's in there and say, God, get rid of it. I've been led out of Egypt, but here I am going right back into it, God. Rescue me from leading myself back into that place. And every single person has something that wants to constantly drive them back into that place. God, help us in this moment to realize that you are trying to draw us out of that place to draw us into your heart. Because there's no place I would rather be than in your presence. And as we sing about your faithfulness, God, in this moment, help us to realize in our darkness, you are faithful. In our sinfulness, you are faithful. In our brokenness, you are faithful. In everything that we are not, you are faithful. Help us to sing this because we feel it. Help us to sing it because we want it. Help us to sing it because we experience it, God. You are faithful. 
In Jesus' name, I pray, would you please rise? Let us sing this song this morning. If you need to respond to this message, come forward this morning. If you just need to praise his name, praise his name this morning. Respond to God how you need to respond to God. And respond to him alone. Not your neighbor, not where you got to be in 10 minutes. Respond to him in this moment, please, people. Let's sing together the praises of our King and how faithful He is. Can you give God a hand clap of praise this morning?